RCSI established an honorary doctorate award in 2011 to recognize excellence and to provide inspiration to you, our students, on your graduation day. The awardees are beyond doubt exceptional people who've made a difference to the world through education, research or service. Previous awardees include former President of Ireland, Mary McAleese, educationalist and international expert in HIV, Father Michael Kelly, the Right Honourable Professor, the Lord Ira Darcy of Imperial College in London, and Professor Abraham Verghese, award-winning author and Stanford academic. We, as RCSI staff, believe that you, our graduates today, will also make a difference for good in the world. And we want, through hearing the stories of these exceptional people and their words, to inspire and to challenge you on this special day to make a difference. President, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our candidate for the RCSI 2015 Honorary Doctoral Award, Mr. Mark Pollock. Mark Pollock, is a, Mark Pollock is an adventure athlete, motivational speaker, collaboration catalyst and author, who through the Mark Pollock Trust is focusing on spinal injury recovery with a mission to find and connect scientists worldwide to fast track a cure for paralysis. Born in Northern Ireland, Mark was educated at the Belfast Inst at Trinity College Dublin, where he became captain of the rowing club. In 1998, at the age of 22, Mark became fully blind. He was a world-class rower when he lost his sight, and competing at sport was an important part of his life and essential to Mark's acceptance of his blindness. In 2002, he went on to win two medals for rowing, a bronze and a silver at the Commonwealth Games. And by September 20, 2003, Mark ran six marathons in seven days across China's Gobi Desert the race of no return, when he raised tens of thousands of euro for the charity Sight Savers International. In addition to numerous challenges and races, ranging from the Dead Sea Ultra Marathon to the North Pole Arctic Marathon, Mark was also the first blind man to race to the South Pole. As part of a three-man team called the South Pole Flag, they took just three weeks in January 2009 to complete the race traveling 770 kilometers over 22 days, pulling 70 kilo sleds for an average of 14 hours per day in temperatures as low as minus 50 degrees. In 2010, Mark published his book, Making It Happen, detailing his struggle and how he rebuilt his life after blindness, motivating the reader to take responsibility, to stop making excuses, and to start making it happen. He has adopted the motto of the Irish polar explorer, Ernest Shackleton, by endurance we conquer. In 2010, Mark fell from a second story window onto concrete and damaged his spinal cord. Left paralyzed, he spent 16 months in hospital and instead of crumbling under the double burden of blindness and paralysis, Mike confronted his spinal cord injury with characteristic grit and resolve, rebuilding his life. With the help of new technology, Mark is exploring the frontiers of spinal injury recovery through physical therapy and robotic technology. He set up the Mark Pollock Trust to find and connect people around the world to fast track a cure for paralysis. He's working with neuroscientists from UCLA to the Pavlov Institute in St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, the Frazier Rehab Institute in Kentucky, and is now the world's principal test pilot for ESCO robotic legs. This cutting edge research uses robotic implants and attachments to communicate messages from the brain that were formerly transmitted by the now damaged spinal cord. Mark was selected by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. He is co-founder of the global running series called Run in the Dark. When in November in over 30 cities worldwide, including Dublin, people will be running in support of the Mark Pollock Trust. But it's not all work. You get a sense of the person when Mark was asked, who would you invite to your dream dinner party? His answer, me, my fiance, Simone George, because she's great fun, intelligent, and loves to party. Cameron Diaz, because she's funny and I remember him in the mask before I, when I could still see. Richard Branson, because he's an adventurer and an entrepreneur. Commander Chris Hatfield, because he seems funny and can play the guitar 
and, by the way, has commanded the International Space Station. And finally, Sir Ernest Shackleton, because he's probably one of the greatest leaders of all time and a true polar explorer. In a day such as today, which is a celebration of education, learning and achievement, we can learn so much from Mark Pollock. As he said to a group of Queen's students, sometimes we choose challenges in life, but sometimes they find us. It is about how we respond to the challenge and what we do in the future that counts. Mark has chosen to receive this honorary doctorate because of his sheer determination, refusal to give up in the face of such daunting physical challenges, together with his commitment and perseverance in pioneering medical progress through scientific collaboration. To quote him again, the fact is that I have a catastrophic spinal cord injury. The fact is that I am paralyzed and cannot move anything below my waist. The fact is that finding a cure has proven to be impossible up to this point in history. But it is also a fact that human history is made up over and over again of accounts of the impossible made possible through human endeavor. President, it is a great pleasure and an honor to recommend to you Mark Pollock for the award of the RCSI Honorary Doctorate. By, by virtue of my office of president, it gives me great pleasure to admit you as the sixth honorary doctorate of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Mark, congratulations. Well done. Good. So we're going to get you to. It now gives me great pleasure to invite the 2015 RCSI Honorary Doctorate, Dr. Mark Pollock, to address our graduates, staff, and guests. Okay. Yeah. Presidents, Chancellor, I'm going to switch the order. Ladies and gentlemen, and I'll leave you the most important, the new graduates to the last, which always seems strange to me in these formalities. I have problems. You've heard about some of them. I'm paralyzed. I'm blind. I'm bald. <laughs> I've got problems. There's no doubt about that. In fact, I've come to expect problems as we explore possibilities. And it's the exploration between problems and possibilities that I want to discuss, address with you today with two stories, one about competition and one about collaboration. The first is about blindness, and the second is about paralysis. So this is obviously going to be a barrel of laughs. When I was 22, I was in university studying for a business studies and economics degree. I was about to graduate and go and start a job in investment banking. It was 1998 when investment banking was socially acceptable to say that you wanted to be a banker. I was a student soon to be graduate, not unlike all of you. But really, I was a rower. I was a competitor, racing in a boat 
for my university and also for Ireland. And one morning, down at the boathouse here in Dublin, at the river, I went down at seven o'clock in the morning to open the boathouse. And as I swung open the doors of the boathouse, the light, the sun came in from the left-hand side and danced on the water flowing by. And I noticed blurring around the edge of my vision, something that I'd seen back when I was five. My retina was detaching. And I sped back to Belfast for an examination, to Manchester for an operation. And in the space of two weeks, I was blind. From that moment, I wasn't involved in my university life. I wasn't involved in the expedition over to London to start those jobs in investment banking. And more particularly, I wasn't involved in my crew. And as a blind person, heavy under the weight of my own biases, I didn't think that blind people competed in jobs, in study, in sport. I didn't think they competed. And of course, I was wrong. And as I rehabilitated and got a guide dog and a white stick and a talking computer, I was also reading around the subject about resilience and bouncing back. And I read a book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning about concentration camps in World War II, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he quotes the philosopher Nietzsche, he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. My meaning was found through sport. And my why was through competing. And that drive to compete got me back in a boat. And I went on to win silver and bronze medals at the Commonwealth Games for Northern Ireland, which I don't say in a kind of self-congratulatory type way, although it may sound like it. If you think about it, my chosen sport was rowing. And once you get to the boat as a blind person and you're sitting in it, you're going backwards anyway. So it doesn't uh, seem remarkable to be able to win races. But it was my drive to compete, my desire to compete that got me back in a boat and I transitioned from a rower to an adventure athlete racing in deserts, mountains, oceans. But it took 10 years to really put the demons of blindness behind me, to convince myself to believe that I really was a competitor, regardless of the blindness. And for me, that meant entering a race to the South Pole, the first race to the South Pole in history. We would be in Antarctica for 43 days, dragging sledges with all our food, survival gear, camping gear, everything we'd need to survive at temperatures as low as minus 50. And I found two guys, Simon O'Donnell and Inga Solheim, an Irishman, and a Norwegian to be on my team, or perhaps more appropriately, I was on their team. And we, two Irishmen and a Norwegian, raced against Norwegian Special Forces, British Royal Marines, guys who had raced to the North Pole before, a double Olympic gold medal rower from Great Britain. It was my chance to prove to myself that I was back being a competitor. And we made it, and we got there. And it was the biggest and best race of my life. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because we're not defined by the results, the highs of success or the lows of failure. Rather, it is our willingness to try that counts, our willingness to compete that counts, not the successes, not the failures. But as you balance the problems that will inevitably emerge and the possibilities that are out there, I suggest that you consider being brave enough to compete. The other side of competition is cooperation. And for my second story, I move from the good old days 
when I was just blind, to the more recent past when I'm now blind and paralyzed, after the point five years ago when I fell out of that window in England and hit the concrete below. Over the following 16 months, I and my fiance and my family learned about spinal cord injury and what it means. The spinal cord injury attacks what it means to be human. It turns us from our upright, running, jumping, skiing forms into seated compromises of our former selves. And as some of you may know from your studies, it's not just the movement and feeling that disappears. It also compromises the internal systems that are designed to keep human beings like you and me alive. There are problems associated with paralysis, no doubt about that. And despite all of the problems, it is a minor miracle, perhaps a major miracle, that medical science has turned this problem from a death sentence as it was 70 years ago into a manageable problem. We survive, we rehabilitate, and we get into wheelchairs. And formal hierarchies are brilliant at dealing with predictable problems in predictable ways. And in your career, you will find many problems that are turned predictable. They're dealt with brilliantly by hierarchies. However, I want to get out of the wheelchair as many paralyzed people also want to get out of their wheelchairs, and that is not a predictable problem. It requires something different, something other than a hierarchy. It requires flatter, collaborative approaches, some risk-taking, the same collaborative approaches that those explorers from 100 years ago took to reach the North and South Poles. So it is flatter, collaborative approaches that I have now been inspired to try and take that, that same approach as I approach the problem of trying to fast track a cure for paralysis and set against a backdrop of no cure in human history for this difficulty, we decided to reach out. We decided to go out there and find if there are other people exploring like those explorers from 100 years ago. And we started with physical exercise and we traveled to California and met people who were trying to reroute the nervous system through exercise. And I suspected that wasn't going to fix my problem, but I wanted to be ready for the next innovation that came down the line. And thankfully, that came quickly. Others have been waiting for 50 years. It only took two years for robotic legs to appear. Exoskeletons, robots that I could get into, strap my legs into, press a button, stand, and walk. And with the help of many thousands of people through the Mark Pollock Trust and Run in the Dark, I became the first person in the world to own a set of robotic legs. And I've done over 500,000 steps now since first getting those legs. But I suspected that physical exercise and robotics wasn't going to fix the problem alone. And we figured we needed some scientists. We did some biological or neuro, neurological intervention. We started to meet people in Cambridge, in Harvard, and eventually in UCLA. And two professors in particular that we met, Professor Reggie Edgerton in UCLA, and his collaborator Yuri Gorosomenko from the Pavlov Institute in Russia. They were working on electrical stimulation of the spine combined with an antidepressant drug to excite the nervous system. And in their lab, one day, a year and a half ago, as they presented their research, I presented my paralyzed legs and exobionics robotic legs. And along with my fiance and Piers White, who runs the Mark Pollock Trust, we proposed that we would move to Los Angeles with my paralyzed legs, with the robotic legs, and we, com we would combine with their electrical stimulation and their drug. And they accepted. Um, last year, we went for three months walking in the robot and seeing what was go on in, going on in the nervous system. 
adding in electrical stimulation while I walked in the robot and seeing what was going on in the nervous system, and then walking for another month with the drug, the electrical stimulation, and the robot to see what was going on. And I could feel and move my le legs to an extent, which was interesting to me, but of course, that is not true, validatable, or replicable until scientists peer review it, publish it in a journal, and then I'll know it was true. That's how science works. <laughs> and it needs to, because we need brilliant hierarchies, but we also need wild collaborations. And now what we're trying to do is get the Americans over to Ireland and continue, continue this research to see what happens over time. Finding a cure for paralysis is not a predictable problem. It's a human crisis, and it's going to require collaboration across geographical, organizational, and intellectual boundaries. It's filled with problems, we know that. But there are possibilities, and we're starting to make progress. It's about collaboration, and it's in fact what we have found in our journey coming from a background of knowing absolutely nothing about your world. It's about meeting people who are humble enough to know that they don't have all the answers. And we have found them. People who are humble enough to reach out, open up, and start collaborating. I want to thank all of you and the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland for awarding me this honorary doctorate. It is a huge privilege. But of course, this is your day, this is your graduation, and it will be your future. And in that future, I expect you will find problems too. I expect you will find and explore possibilities. And as you do, I suggest that you consider being brave enough to compete, being humble enough to collaborate, and perhaps most importantly of all, continuing to be ambitious enough to explore. Thank you.